this is Heidi Merritt with Insulin Nation, and we are here today at the Joslin Diabetes Innovation Summit in Arlington, Virginia. And I am here with Nicholas Christakis. Hello, how are you? Nice Thanks. to see you, Heidi. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I didn't know how to describe what you do because you do so many things. The Hi. short version would be that I'm a physician and a social scientist. Yeah. I'm appointed in the departments of medicine and healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School and in the Department of Sociology at the Faculty of Arts right. and Sciences. So I used to clinically I used to see patients as a hospice doctor. Okay. And oh. uh, I do research on um, quantitative aspects of behavior that mm -hmm. relate to how people act. Uh, and most recently I've been studying real life social networks. Right, I bought your book, oh. Connected, and I was I forgot to bring it, for, oh. but I wanted you to sign it. But anyway, <laughs> I did start it and it's really uh, fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, I have five questions to okay. ask you. We can start with that. The first one is, what is your greatest aspiration for combining technology and healthcare? Um, where do I see the technical frontier? I see, I mean, I think there are many uh, ways in which technology and healthcare can be combined. So I don't want to make a hard claim that one particular way is the best way uh, or the most inventive or creative way. But the way with which I'm the most familiar and a way in which I think we can improve substantially health in America is by taking advantage of what everyone's been talking about, which is big data. Mm -hmm. So if you had talked to social scientists 20 years ago uh, about what powers they dreamed of having, they would have said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have little Black Hawk helicopters, little tiny microscopic Black Hawk helicopters that flew on top of everybody right. and, one, and monitored where they were and uh, who they were talking to uh, and what they were buying, what they were eating, uh, how fast they were moving, what they were thinking even. Uh, and if we could do all of this for millions of people in real time, right. that would be amazing. And of course, that's what we have We're now. doing that, That's right. what we're doing. Right. And so we can take these data, we can use these data to understand human behavior in a whole new way. Wow. And I think that not only can we then understand human behavior, but we can intervene in a way that is um, helpful, right. whether it's with patients that already have illness or patients in whom we're trying to prevent illness. Right, that's great. So that's where I think the A frontier uh, at the intersection of technology and right. medicine is. It's really cool. These yeah. things are actually coming about. Absolutely, and they're yeah. coming about in a variety of ways. I mean, you can take these data and feed them into little apps that people have. Yep. You can analyze the data passively. For example, you could take people's cell phone signals uh, and study how their cell phone signals change. For example, if you're if you're if you break a leg. Uh, the phone company can probably develop an algorithm to know that. Right. It will know this because your call pattern will change, who you call, how often they call you versus how often you call them, right. how much you move, you're now more homebound than right. you were before, etc. Right. In this uh, sort of brave new world, we're going to need to pay proper attention to confidentiality and uh, review of the use of these data. Right. But I would say that this is no more dangerous than um, any of a number of other technologies. For instance, chemotherapy. Right. I mean, at least with uh, with uh, this type of technology, the worst thing that can happen to you is is that your privacy will be compromised. Right. Too much You don't die. Right. right. You don't die yeah. because you got a drug that was toxic. Right. And what this is another, my questions are morphing a little bit today. Uh, um, do you think that because of the technology, do you think we're leaving people out that yes. aren't savvy? Yes. I think um, with any technological innovation, I mean, across centuries, new technologies are typically available to and deployed in, upon and by um, socioeconomically privileged individuals. Right. So I think, you know, whether it's the invention of the internet and which households, you know, rich households get the internet first. Or cable. Or, or cable, yeah, cable. Yeah. <laughs> or going way back to any technology you can right. imagine, whether it's cars or new drugs. You right. know, when penicillin was first invented, who gets it? Right. Um, so, um, did you read the book called Breakthrough? It's about the discovery of insulin. No, I I'm going to hook you up with yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure something similar applied. So the question then becomes, how do we, as a as a kind of plural polity, exercise democratic control over the creation of technology and the availability of technology? Right. And so I think that the the answer to your question is is that to um, to allocate the kind of fruits of scientific innovation fairly, we need to rely on the customary sorts of democratic institutions that we right. have. I mean, you can see the same. You're going to see the same thing with stem cell innovations and stem cell biology, uh, and you're going to see um, across broad types of technological innovations challenges that will only be solved, in my judgment, through a kind of political process. All right. So the uh, catchphrase for the um, conference is "Be part of the solution." Uh huh. Um, you kind of covered that, but what does that really mean to you? 
I think that, uh, you know, I'm much more, the kind of work I do is much more relevant not to the treatment of diabetes, although some of the work we do is relevant to why patients do or do not adhere to oh. their uh, medications. It's hard. Um, my work is more relevant to how to prevent the onset of diabetes in the first place. For right. instance, we've done some work looking at um, behavioral contagion. How do uh, exercise behaviors or eating behaviors or right. smoking behaviors, all of which can predispose you to diabetes and other ser uh, serious diseases, how do they spread from person to person in networks right. or from person to person to person or from person to person to person to person? Right. And the networks that I'm interested in are real life face to face networks, yep. not so much the online networks. Right. Although those two represent a new technological frontier which could be deployed uh, to help people. So for instance, you can imagine creating uh, online forums where people could interact, let's say with diabetes, and it would be, it is possible to manipulate their interactions in such a fashion that you encourage proper behavior. Right, um, and this is kind of a no-brainer for you because you're all about teamwork and you know group involvement. But um, do you think get the attitude here of working for a cure or a solution as a team instead of using um, you know, competition as a motivator? Uh, do you think such, it's gonna work as well? I think that's such a broad uh, question, it's hard to answer specifically. I think some healthy competition, certainly among scientists, uh, is helpful. It right. you know, prompts people to do their best. Right. But I think there's probably a parabola, you know, yeah. like no competition is bad for innovation. I remember that word too from much, high school. Yeah, too much competition. <laughs> I haven't too heard much, it in yeah, years. Yeah, it's a curve that like, right. like yeah. Right, wow. Yeah, too much, yeah, Thanks, exactly. Nobles. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Uh, you went to Nobles? Yeah. Oh my God. Did you? No, no, but I know the school. Oh, uh, good. Yeah, so. Uh, so we uh, love yeah, you should send you we should send Harvard. yeah yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you should send your high school math teacher a thank you note. Okay. So it's like uh, Mr. It's, Tubin. Yeah, Mr. Tubin needs a note. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, and I'll send it for you. Nice. Uh, so uh, so anyway, so too little competition is bad for innovation. Too much can be bad if people are very secretive. Mm -hmm. And so you want something in between. And in fact, things like that were even foreseen by Benjamin Franklin when he created the patent office. Right. Right. You want to give people some opportunity to benefit from their own. Right. But you don't want them to be able to keep it forever a secret right. from others. Like the, that book. Breakthrough. Um, they talk about you know it's the discovery of insulin, and uh, back in the day, it was such a, it was so competitive, and it was so important to get your name on it that like you know it was only allowed out in certain amounts, yes. the, the, and uh, you know it was international, and yes. it was people like lost you know their titles and yes. lost positions. It was so competitive to get your name on the yes. insulin, but anyway. I've totally asked you more than five questions. That's fine. So I just want to say thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me.